My name is Michael, and I am from St. Joseph. I like stories. This week I'm here to unravel the web of connections in Ergo Proxy, a post-apocalyptic philosophical science fiction mystery set in a dead world. A dead world barely populated with test tube humans relegated to dystopian dome cities, their entourage robots known as autoraves, and the elusive godlike creatures called proxies. Episode 13, titled Wrong Way Home, stood out to me the first time I watched this show about 10 years ago, and it has stuck with me upon rewatch. I would like to go scene by scene and analyze this episode to explain why it is so well written and share the love I have for this mid-2000s punk anime original. The episode begins with a brief flashback of our main character's personal entourage robot being chastised by the Collective, a cryptic presumed to be group of artificial intelligence who stand before the Grand Regent and are tasked with maintaining the city of Romdo. The rebellious granddaughter of the Regent, named Riel Mayer, often ignored the instruction she was given by her superiors. If you've seen any clips or promotions for this show, you'll know Riel as a badass blasting things with her tactical shotgun. Despite her assignment to the Intelligence Bureau and her prestige as princess, she was not supposed to be gallivanting around, investigating willy-nilly. And so, her entourage autorave, lovingly named Iggy, had the responsibility of keeping the tomboy princess in check. As demonstrated in another brief flashback, this keeping in check rarely happened. Riel knew which buttons to press, literally and figuratively, to coerce Iggy to help her on whatever dangerous mission she set for herself. Iggy's drive to protect Riel overrode its directive from on high to prevent her from getting into danger to begin with. Thus, adventure ensues. It is this exact setup that starts the show, and it is this troubled cycle that brought Iggy to where it is now, at a crossroads reflecting on the condescending remarks from the collective which threaten its purpose, its raison d'etre, or reason to exist. Lose her and you will lose your meaning, threatened the floating speaking statues. Meaninglessness doesn't sound quite so bad at first until you familiarize yourself with how Romdo operates. It's a scientific city where each human or autorave is created for a specific assignment. If you cease to be useful, if you lose your raison d'etre, you very quickly become targeted for disposal. The dead world we find ourselves in is one that is slowly and steadily receding into nothingness, atrophy. All resources must be accounted for. Even one troubled autorave who struggled to manage a 19-year-old hotshot who thought she had it all figured out. You'll never understand, snapped Riel at her sidekick. The magnificent writing in this episode begins with this line, You'll never understand. It is emblematic of not only the events that will transpire in this episode, but encapsulates the entire theme of Ergo Proxy as a narrative production. Understanding Purpose Losing Purpose There is micro and macro level foreshadowing that reinforces the message of the show itself. Also, it is a perfectly apt line for a late teen know-it-all like Riel Mayer. The best story writing does not waste a single line. Intention must permeate every word and present manifold meaning that ties all narrative threads together. Doubly so if you're writing with a flair for the thought-provoking and philosophical. Quadruply so if your story has audiovisual components that require a director's hand. The first minute of this episode achieves all these things and more before the drop of the very stylish anime opening. But we aren't quite done with the first minute yet. 
The series of flashbacks end, and Iggy is startled awake from its trance. A close-up of its face in the dark. Pan out, and we are in the cockpit of an aircraft flying through a snowstorm. Iggy was alone. Another cut to see Riel taking shelter from the storm in a cave, while the collective repeats in the audience's ear, She is your raison d'etre. Lose her, and it will be taken from you. That is the bond between an entourage and its master. Another close-up of Iggy's face. This time, its eyes are glowing red. Obviously, Iggy was upset. However, the red eyes are not only for dramatic effect, but also indicate another important plot point. The investigation Riel pushed too far into that initiated this series of events began with the Cogito virus. The Cogito virus is said to give autoraves self-awareness, self-consciousness, and a soul. It is revealed that Iggy is no longer a simple automaton, strictly bound by its programming. It can break the rules. He can disobey. We have set the scene. An abrupt change in setting, from episode 12 to episode 13, film grain haze, and audio whoosh sound effects, tells the audience from the first few seconds we are having flashbacks. As with any good story, you drop breadcrumbs throughout, you keep a steady pace, and you follow through with your plot threads to completion or closure. If you were to drop in, having not seen the previous 12 episodes, you would still have a sense for what the episode is about, who it will be concerning, potential conflict, etc. A flashback is a tricky narrative device to do correctly. It's often used to patchwork a scene that was not set up properly. Throwing out new information by jumping back and forth in time can be jarring. It can cheapen narrative impact. None of those things happened here. What we had was an interlacing of threads of the web. There was some new information provided, some new context to Iggy's plight, but it was woven together with events which have already transpired with words that have already been said. Cut back to present, and our main cast of characters were far from their original home city of Romdo. Iggy was separated from Riel despite the opening scene reminding him that it was absolutely wrong for him to be without her. It was Riel that sent him away. She changed the plan. Again. She ordered Iggy to leave her in the wasteland with a dangerous, godlike proxy disguised as a man named Vincent Law. This wasn't part of the plan. She was supposed to use the weapon developed by her scientist friend to kill the immortal proxy Vincent Law and take his body back to Romdo for research. It so happened that the special gun with its two special bullets was used last episode to kill a proxy, but it was not Vincent who received the death blow. It was another he fought with. So, Riel decided she would continue her investigation, up close and personal, by joining the amnesiac Vincent on his journey to discover what a proxy truly was, thereby assigning Iggy to pick up the pieces of the old plan by delivering this other dead proxy back to Romdo. But her plan could not be initiated through a snowstorm. Their wind-powered landship, often referred to as the Rabbit, wouldn't survive such conditions. So instead, we get to see Little Miss Sourpuss pout in the dark and make royal demands of her two new travel partners. Vincent, the proxy, and Pino, the autorave. Pino is a childlike autorave infected with the Cogito virus, who was surprisingly helpful in Vincent's escape from the city. The ship isn't helpful, and Pino isn't helpful either, asked Riel rhetorically. Another line from Riel that makes a connection for us. Comparing Pino to the ship named Rabbit, when Pino had a propensity to dress up in a rabbit suit. Surely you see the connection. 
I do love Ergo Proxy despite the criticisms of being overly reliant on reference and philosophy. I think if the Matrix can get away with Alice in Wonderland references, then we can forgive them here. Pino the Guide, the same as the rabbit down the rabbit hole, the rabbit as the ship that drove them through the wasteland, aka Wonderland. Now, who is this one-armed girl walking through a blizzard, unfazed? She looks awfully sad, but perked up upon seeing Iggy return in his aircraft. Iggy reminds us who she is after reflecting back on his deep disgust for proxies. Proxies, if it weren't for them. Vincent Law. These three simple lines tell us Iggy's intentions. He's interrupted by the one-armed girl banging on the exterior hull. It's that autorave, he exclaimed. What does that tell us? The two have met before, and she is also an autorave. That's three robots, one living proxy, one dead proxy, and one mostly normal human woman. Are you keeping track? The reason there isn't a tally of characters in an episode and checkmark boxes for events is because that's not how you tell a story. It's sleight of hand, give and take, catch and release. We are subtly building the drama so as to not overwhelm. It takes time to unravel the web because stories are an analog to lives we live which are all experienced in time. Did she come to retrieve it? asked Iggy, referring, of course, to the dead proxy stashed for delivery. It is worth mentioning this nameless auto-rave girl got her arm torn off in the fight from last episode between Vincent and the other proxy. She was dead set on prying this aircraft open. Before Iggy could confront her, we are shown him grabbing something. He pointed the device at the girl. She paused, only to rush inside and meet the dead proxy locked in a sealed glass coffin. Out of hatred for proxies and a desire to rid himself of the annoying girl, Iggy gave the body back to her. Worth noting again that this autorave girl never spoke once. Not last episode, nor this one. That is a keeping of consistency. Autoraves can speak. This one does not. She's an exception. As she dragged the body away, Iggy felt a tinge of sadness. He realized something. Wait, is that your master? A cold stare is all the answer he was given. You see the question of entourage and master brought up again. Why was this robot girl so attached to this freakish creature in a wasteland? It is because the proxy is, or was, her reason for existence. Iggy's curiosity overtook him, and he decided to follow the girl back to their decrepit dwelling inside another cave. The girl caressed the head of the ugly dead monster. Another essential line from Iggy followed. Are you the one who took care of that proxy? Just as he was tasked with taking care of Riel. He searched their home to discover the moss-covered cave hid an advanced science lab underneath. It was an exact copy of the birthing chambers back in Romdo, where the test tube humans were manufactured. While this scene is less relevant to the immediate unfolding narrative, it is noteworthy for two reasons. Number one, it re-establishes that Romdo is not the only place on Earth where these wombs were set up. Number two, Iggy had prior knowledge of these test tubes because he was taken under the care of Riel's scientist friend earlier in the show who headed this department. All threads tied together, and nothing is unaccounted for. Curiously, the girl stayed Iggy's hand as he uncovered. She covered it again. 
did that thing create it? Another macro-level plot point. Well, it doesn't matter anyways. Bringing the plot back to the micro-level, to the present concerns of Iggy. What are you going to do now that you've lost your master? lamented Iggy. His lamentation wasn't only, or even primarily, for the autorave servant girl. He was speaking to himself about Riel. As proof of this, we transition back to Riel, sleeping lightly by a fire. Asleep in a cave. Hmm. Vincent's lovebird concern for Riel is misinterpreted as an attempt to pry the proxy-killing gun away from her. Riel always assumed the worst. Vincent assured her he was simply concerned for her well-being in the cold. Riel's attention turned away from him and towards her hair. This is the second time this episode her hair had been expressly highlighted, and it won't be the last time either. Why does this matter? For so many reasons. The dialogue I have referenced so far hints at past and future events openly, loudly. Showcasing Riel's hair does this silently and to amazing effect. In the first minute, we are shown a scene of Iggy doing Riel's hair. As evidenced by her peculiar hairstyle and makeup, she cared deeply about her looks. She trusted Iggy to do this for her. She arrogantly threw the comb at Pino, who was quietly reading a book by the fire. Do my hair, demanded Riel. Pino, now dressed up as the rabbit, ignored her. Then she angrily responded in the third person, Pino is reading a book. A fun note here is how Pino turned the page of the book from right to left in the Eastern style. This is funny because she was reading an English copy of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, a book that had been featured more than once in the show and one that is certainly not read from right to left. Was this an error on behalf of the Japanese creators or an intentional idiosyncrasy of Pino the autorave child? Riel picked up her discarded comb and handed it to Vincent. He held the comb uncomfortably in his hand beside the fire. The comb was a passing of the torch. Riel was trying to find a replacement for Iggy. As confirmation, Riel despondently exclaimed, My God, how am I supposed to survive without Iggy? There is a layer deeper to this connection between Hare and Riel's relationship with the other characters. In this brief few seconds, we have four symbols of death. Cold, cave, sleep, and hair. Hair is a dressing, an adornment for people, but, simultaneously, it isn't truly alive or exactly united with who you are. An extremity or flowing garment. We are being told repeatedly, over and over, someone is going to die this episode. Who will it be? We transition back to Iggy in the other cave. The transitions so far have been absolutely immaculate. This one is a stellar example. We have a flow of conversation between three characters, Riel, Vincent, and Pino. This exchange ends with Riel referencing Iggy. This flow eases the transition from character perspectives. It greases the wheels, for lack of a better term. Before we transition to Riel, it was a close-up of Iggy's face speaking to the autorave servant girl about her master. The cut to Riel's face showed us who Iggy was truly speaking of. It was not a surprise. There is a circularity at play. We have established a cycle from the beginning of the episode about who the characters are and roughly how long we'll focus on each one before transitioning to the next. This is a continual building of drama for eventual confrontation. When all points of the web intersect, the cycle will be broken and give birth to a new one in due time. For now, we are back to Iggy working through the aching in his mechanical heart. A master is a master, no matter who they are. Entourages can't live without a master. Iggy didn't hate the servant girl, despite her service to a proxy. It wasn't the girl who chose her master or her creator. This led to the final conclusion Iggy came to after his many self-reflections, the first half of the episode. 
He reasoned there's only one thing left to do. There's only one way for him to get what he desired. To preserve his reason for existence. I'll kill the one who took my master from me. Yes, I'll kill him. If I kill the one who took her, she'll come back. You'll be a good girl and come back to me, won't you, Riel? Iggy was not without his own sarcastic quips. Riel was not a good girl who did what she ought to do, so Iggy would force her to. Instead of being the one who was bent, he would do the bending. We cut to the servant girl's face after he said these things. Why? Because she heard him speak this line. If I kill the one who took her, she'll come back. Who was it who killed the servant girl's master last episode? It was Riel. She fired one of the two bullets from her gun and killed the monster. Iggy just taught the girl a dangerous lesson. Perhaps if she killed the one who slayed her master, the master would return to her, return to life. Her meaning could be restored. The director silently connects this dot again by immediately transitioning from an image of the servant girl's face to a close-up of Riel's face. She's satisfied with Vincent's impromptu hairdressing. I'll have you do it from now on, said Riel. Iggy's replacement had been found. Also, conveniently, in case you missed the subtle connection between the servant girl and Riel, we are shown the girl again with the exact line from Iggy, If I kill the one who took her, she'll come back. Riel left to check up on the ship, despite Vincent's protests. She was alone until Iggy arrived. His arrival completes the circle, connects the dots, weaves the web. The sequence was set in motion the moment Iggy called out to Riel. She was upset by his presence. She ordered him to go back to Romdo. Then, finally, she realized Iggy was not the same as he once was. He's infected with the virus. Iggy had no obligation to entertain Riel anymore. His true feelings were revealed. He's been infected for a very long time now, about half the show's runtime at this point, and Riel never noticed. Oblivious, self-centered. He insulted her intelligence to hide the hidden pain of being ignored by his master. Revealing that Iggy bypassed the tests designed to detect the virus achieves two things narratively. Firstly, it explains the twist of how he was infected for such a long time without detection. Secondly, it shows how clever and smart he is as a character, much more so than Riel. All this time, said Riel. Iggy responded to comfort her, to comfort himself. But I haven't changed at all. You're the only one I've ever obeyed, the only one I've protected. He reached out and stroked her hair. This is the third and final time Riel's hair is used this episode. Riel had returned to Iggy so he may fulfill his role again. The first time her hair was shown, it was Riel's willing participation. The second time, it was for a replacement. The third time, Iggy reprised his role forcibly. As a reminder, someone is going to die this episode. How can you not need me? The last line from Iggy before he punched the girl in the stomach so hard it knocked the braggadocious woman out cold. Knocked out. Asleep. Synonymous with death. It happened right after Iggy touched her hair. It happened in a cave. Repetition with slight modification creates progression. You see the cycle. You see how it repeats the pattern bit by bit, piece by piece as we build a much grander structure. He took her out of the cave into the pure white snowstorm. We are back to Vincent and the fire was running low. Pino was still a little grumpy, so Vincent went alone to find more kindling for the fire. He couldn't let the torch burn out. This is a good motivation to move him out of the cave and into the world for a wider conflict, for future confrontation. Really, though, this scene is a simple breather for what comes next. The greatest roast of any fictional character I've ever witnessed. Rhea woke up from her second slumber this episode. The first willingly by the fire. The second 
unwillingly in a reinforced glass coffin. Fitting that the beast she killed and stored there is now where Iggy trapped her. This scene is my favorite scene of the entire show and one of my favorite scenes of all time. It is a perfect example of a character reaching their lowest point. The icing on the cake is Iggy's Japanese voice actor, who gives one of the best performances I have ever heard. At risk of AI copyright algorithms striking me dead where I stand, I'd like to share with you this scene in its entirety.気づいたか、ディルメイヤ。俺は今までお前に散々いいように扱われてきたからな。これからは俺のいいように単なるカスタマイズではないか。それだけじゃない。私にはお前の言動全てが意義だとは思えない。これが小人による変化ならば真にも等しい変化だ。やはり意義は小人に感染して死んだ。黙れ。相変わらず身勝手な女だな、ディ
was still making demands. Are you awake, Riel Mayer? This line is another example of weaving the web, micro and macro level connections. Episode one begins with the awakening, most especially the awakening of Riel to a grander conspiracy. Is she finally awake, truly awake, is the truth seeker finally awake with open eyes? Has Alice finally woken up from the dream? To Iggy, it was a snide comment, but for the purposes of the narrative, it is so much more. My speech is simply a matter of my customization, isn't it? Earlier in the show, Iggy referenced Riel's customization of his speech patterns. Iggy's sarcastic droll speech originally came from Riel herself. Look at Iggy's design. What else do you think she customized? She put the makeup on his eyes and head. His eyes have heavy eye shadow like hers. The two dots represent the two horns she styled her hair with. We aren't ever told exactly how long Riel and Iggy had been together, but it is assumed to be a long time, maybe even Riel's entire life. She made Iggy cute and probably gave him his cute name, too. Riel's only defense throughout this exchange was undermining Iggy's sense of self. She was, quite literally, trying to escape by giving Iggy an existential crisis, something he's been grappling with this whole episode and half the show prior. Iggy did not like that. His instability is presented so masterfully it's almost hard to put into words. Riel was afraid. You always were a selfish bitch, Riel but that doesn't give you the right to kill me off just because I don't serve your purposes anymore. Iggy's protection of Riel served his purposes now. It gave Iggy purpose to protect Riel, whether she wanted his protection or not. He countered the claim that the virus killed the real Iggy by attesting to his faithful service. Why, if he wasn't truly him, would he have stayed with Riel, who he secretly loved and despised? Rael didn't have an answer to this. I'm your favorite. You're the one who customized my speech settings. He didn't want to be replaced by Vincent, the one who stole her away. Now, now, you're letting that pretty face of yours go to waste. Girls shouldn't make such unpleasant faces. More snark from the red-eyed robot. Then you've been deceiving me all this time? Riel was defeated in the last verbal exchange, so she changed tactics. She'll catch her servant in a moral wrong, lying, disloyalty. It's unacceptable for an entourage to deceive its master. A loyal entourage would never act like this. Once you deceived me, your master, you ceased to be Iggy. An admirable attempt from Riel, all things considered. But this persuasive parlay was dispatched even more easily by Iggy. Don't get smart with me, Riel Mayer. Who the hell do you think is responsible for all this? It was Riel that pushed the investigation into truth too far. She initiated this series of events. Iggy was completely prepared to cast all blame on her. An important note here on the writing of this dialogue is how Iggy referred to Riel. Almost every time in this exchange, he referred to her by her full name. This is a rhetorical tool used by people to hold power over the person they are talking to, to speak more directly to them as a whole person. It is a closer, more personal, and more manipulative form of reference. It was after this Iggy unleashed his final barrage. Selfish Riel. Useless Riel. Incompetent Riel. Besides me, who could handle a woman like you? You're much more incompetent than you think, posing as a hotshot career woman in Romdo without even knowing. But who do you think made it all possible for you? Who was always there to support you, you reckless, arrogant bitch? Me. You say I'm unacceptable? That's my line. I don't accept that you don't need me. Riel had been completely and utterly crushed into dust. Throughout this novel-length string of insults, she had nothing to offer but offended gasps. The only thing she's left with is herself. What are you going to do with me? Iggy's confidence was bursting at the seams. He cheekily laughed in response. Are you finally starting to worry about yourself? The sarcastic quip was another slight at her, 
who, up until this point, did whatever she pleased with reckless abandon, expecting Iggy to pick up the pieces. Ultimately, nothing had changed. Iggy would continue to protect Riel. We near the end of the argument by connecting another plot thread of the episode. Riel, remember when you said I would never understand as an autorave because I don't have a soul? But I do have a soul. How could you not have realized? Again, the elasticity of Iggy in this moment is enormous. Here he is more sentimental, more heartbroken. We can't make it back to Romdo in the U-4 anymore, but there's still a ship. Very important plot detail here. It was mentioned in the previous episode that the aircraft only had enough fuel to return back to Romdo from this point. Because Iggy turned back around from the home flight, the fuel was now insufficient. He would have to commandeer the wind-powered land ship. Even if you go back to Romdo, you're infected with the Gugito, and they'll simply have you destroyed. The entire exchange ended, surprisingly, with Riel as the victor. This was a flaw in Iggy's plan he either hadn't considered or didn't care about. He silently left to go steal the rabbit. As he walked away, we pan to the servant girl patiently waiting for an opportunity to be alone with the killer of her master. The whole scene from every vantage point is masterfully done. How, as a writer, do you make two characters talking with each other the most compelling moment of a story? Framing, stakes, dialogue, presentation, direction. You must bring all the threads together and use every tool at your disposal. That is exactly what was achieved here. Riel was a wash of light in the luminous coffin, whilst Iggy held a bittersweet parade in darkness. Only his piercing red eyes shone through. After Iggy left, Riel realized she was missing a critical item. He took her gun with the one remaining proxy-killing bullet loaded inside. Riel had two guns, the tactical shotgun she kept slung on her hip and a small sci-fi derringer that fired the proxy-killing bullets. There is a narrative device called Chekhov's gun that is at play almost everywhere this episode. It doesn't always or even usually take the form of a literal gun, but this episode, it might. I'll give you a hint. Something is being shot at someone this episode, but I guarantee you, you'll never guess it correctly. And it isn't because it wasn't set up prior in this episode, or because I failed to mention it. That's what's so fun. That's the trick. That's the sleight of hand. Who appeared after Riel discovered Iggy took her gun? The servant girl, whose master Riel killed with that same gun. Meanwhile, Ernest Vincent busied himself with collecting firewood. Pino warmed up to the idea of helping collect, so she gathered uh, mushrooms. I suspect this is another sly Alice in Wonderland reference. We follow the rabbit until she bumped into Iggy, who was also in search of a rabbit. A deadly stare down between a hyperfixated robot and a disguised godlike creature ensued. Riel is going to kill you someday. Why do you need her? Iggy repeated the promise Riel made to Vincent last episode. Meanwhile, the servant girl is trying to smash the reinforced glass and kill Riel. You can't protect Riel, because you are destined to kill her. Iggy believed the half-man, half-monster would lose control and kill his raison d'etre. Cracks begin to show in Riel's coffin. I can see it. A hideous monster tormenting Riel as she lies struggling in agony. That monster is you, Vincent Law. Iggy lifted the gun and pointed it at Vincent. Vincent contorted his face in anger, proving Iggy's point. That look. It's the same look you had when Riel pointed the gun at you. It's the look that tells me you're invariably going to kill Riel. My dear Riel. Iggy loved her. Vincent swatted the gun away from Iggy before he had the chance to pull the trigger. The servant girl smashed Riel's coffin open, allowing her to escape before the girl could swing again. Riel crawled away on hands and knees. Iggy ran away from Vincent now that he'd been disarmed. The circle is getting smaller. The cycle is getting faster. The action is picking up 
as all the pieces fit together and the web pulls tighter. Riel was running away from the servant girl, but managed to trip and fall on her face. She kicked at the servant girl with her feet pathetically, undignified. The servant girl pulled a knife and jumped on her chest prepared to kill her. But then... A gun was fired. Not the special proxy-killing gun or the shotgun, but the strange device Iggy pointed at the girl in the first half of the episode. This brief scene was Chekhov's gun. It was a flare gun used for emergencies Iggy repurposed to save Riel. The flash of light was the rapturous applause for Iggy saving the day yet again. Vincent arrived late to the scene, much to Riel's dismay. He held her pistol. Well done, Vincent. Now I can't kill you. I lose. Vincent moved to apologize, but was interrupted by the servant girl springing up from the ground to kill Riel again. Her eyes blinked a beeping red countdown to detonation, and her hand was tight around Riel's throat. Iggy swooped in and yanked the girl away from Riel, and ran away as fast as he could. Vincent slid to Riel's side to protect her as well. The servant girl exploded, taking Iggy with her. His dismembered head was discarded in the snow, still calling out to Riel. We are back in a cave and Riel cradled the head of what remained of Iggy. The conflict in Iggy's soul was not yet satisfied. His sadness was ever-present, and his half-destroyed face displayed this turmoil openly. Look, Riel Mayer, look what you've done to me. A woman like you isn't worth protecting, but your death would make my life meaningless. Why were you the master, you of all people? Spit Iggy in disgust. Riel looked down in regret. Iggy whispered softly to her. Riel. Hey, don't hate me, okay? Iggy, responded Riel quietly. It was hard for me, but I wanted to be with you no matter what. I suffered for so long, Riel. Anger overtook him. It's your fault, you good-for-nothing bitch! Softness returned. Please, Riel, don't hate me. Tears well up in her eyes. Deal, Deal me up! We hear the shot echo out of the cave, interrupting Pino's unintended funeral song. I know this feeling. This is sadness, said Pino as she laid flowers atop Eggie's grave. This line was another reference to earlier in the show when Pino lost a friend of hers. She, being a robot and a child, had no concept of death. She had to learn what sadness was. Riel began, Does the Kugito... But she cut this line short, speculating about the virus and its effects. Wasn't right for this moment. She reframed the question more personally for the child. I mean... Does it make you unhappy to know what sadness is? I think it probably makes me happy. Why is that? I don't know. I'm going to go put some flowers on that girl's grave, too. Why didn't Iggy leave? With the virus, he didn't need to obey Riel. She didn't have to be his master. She cried. After listening to all this, you may think I have been very harsh toward Riel. You may think I don't like her as a character because she's an arrogant, snotty princess. You would be absolutely, completely, and utterly wrong. It is this episode that completes her character and marks a big, gigantic, tectonic shift in the show's story structure. The second half becomes much more loose and experimental. Iggy was used to reveal the shortcomings of Riel to Riel. He confronted her face to face and taught her shame. It was never that she disliked Iggy or disregarded him on purpose. On the contrary, she loved Iggy, but in her youthful ignorance she took advantage of him. Her mission, her purpose in this show was to seek truth, yet often she found the truth and was too blind to see it. Are you awake? Are your eyes open? She faced a trial. 
she was brought low. She wasn't the badass blasting crazed robots like in the promotions. The only time she fired her gun this episode was to end the suffering of the closest friend she ever had. And who appeared at this lowest point? The replacement she found for Iggy at the beginning of the episode. Vincent arrived to console her. Still not wanting to show weakness, Riel put on a brave face. Vincent, the well-meaning monster man, gave her back the proxy-killing gun. Why? Because he's a simp. No, 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 no. Uh, I'll be nice. He did care for Riel. He would protect Riel, unlike the terrible prophecy given by Iggy. They would go on this journey together to uncover truth. And besides, Riel promised not to kill him yet. What is the final story writing thread to examine? It's the gun. Why did the writer choose not to have Iggy fire the last remaining bullet? The events of this episode would have remained almost exactly the same if Iggy fired the gun and missed. The reason is to keep this plot thread in play. If Riel lacked the ability to kill Vincent, that excitement, that drama, that potential would come to an end. Our final lesson is when to find closure and when to keep spinning the web. If you made it to the end, congratulations and thank you. You have the same level of fascination for niche weird stories, animation, and writing as I do. If you want more from me, do please like, share, subscribe, stalk, and comment your thoughts. You can read this script and much more on my website, michaelofstjoseph.com. Links will be in the video description. When it comes to storytelling, the end is never really the end. I'll be back next week with another long-winded story writing web about the League of Legends series Arcane. Until then, spin on.